So good morning everyone. Um, very nice to see everyone in this uh, hall this morning. Um, I wanted to thank Brother Minhi for offering a guided meditation uh, a few minutes earlier so that we have a chance to remember and celebrate our teacher, um, Tay. He is in Hue, Vietnam right now. Um, and I can imagine that the Sangha there is also, um, or maybe they have already tried to do something uh, to celebrate his continuation day today. Uh, today is his 94th continuation day. It sounds like you're only 94 days old, but <laughs> continue. we substitute the word birthday for uh, continuation. Because in Plum Village we don't speak about so much about birth and death, but we think of birth and death in terms of continuation. So instead of happy birthday, we say happy continuation. So today we say happy continuation to Tay, to Tay who is 94 years old. Or timeless, whichever way you want to, whichever number you want to use, it's okay. Um, so in Plum Village, um, we are in our rains retreat and in our rains retreat every single year we have a chance to do shining light. And I don't know if the other hamlets have started your shining light sessions yet, but in Lower Hamlet we have already started with a couple of shining light sessions. And uh, shining light in lay terms is probably like a, a performance review. <laughs> You can think of it as, a, as like a performance review, but only in the monastery, it's a bit different. Um, we don't receive this review or this shining light in order to uh, be more successful at our a job or anything, or uh, to get a raise, or to get promoted. Um, but we receive a kind of a feedback session, performance review, or we call it shining light. Um, so that uh, we can, we can uh, have a bit more insight into how we are practicing and how we are, we are living in community. And the end result is not a promotion, but maybe to be able to enrich our uh, spiritual life, our spiritual dimension. And what I like about this practice is actually the contemplation that we read before the session. And the first time I heard it, I was, I was quite moved because it allowed me to see the other person, see my, my sister, my friend, my brother in a different uh, way. So I will just read the first I will, I will just read the contemplation for you, and you can see. So this is a contemplation before a shining light session. When I look at you, I see you as a flowing stream and not as a separate self to reproach or to praise. Looking into you, I see your ancestors, your lineage, your parents, your homeland, your culture, the things that are great and beautiful, and the things that are not yet great and beautiful. You are a wonderful manifestation, a flower in the garden of humanity. I am aware of your presence, and I cherish your presence. I also hope that you see me as a flowing stream, and not as a separate self to reproach, to criticize, or to praise, we are brothers and sisters of each other in the Sangha. Therefore, I have you in me and you have me in you. We must support and encourage each other to cultivate further the things that are great and beautiful in us 
and to transform those that are not yet so great and beautiful. If I said something to help you transform, it is not a reproach, but it is my hope for you. Looking into me, you also see the things that are unskillful and imperfect. And if you said something to me, it is not a criticism or a reproach, but it is only a hope for me to transform. When you transform, I can be happier. And when I can, I transform, you can be happier. We support one another on the path of practice. We need each other. I deeply cherish your presence in our community. So this is the kind of language that we read out and we remind each other before we offer each other feedback. And uh, the feedback, oftentimes, uh, it, it has to start with flower watering. It means we acknowledge the talents, the goodness, uh, the wonderful things, the wonderful qualities in the other person before we, allow, we uh, offer them uh, some kind of constructive feedback. Uh, and constructive, that kind of feedback can sometimes be in the form of, uh, maybe you can come to activities on time, something like that. Not so big, but even such a, a small feedback, you need to offer flowers before you, you even offer uh, that feedback. Mm, or that kind of shining light. Um, so what I like about this contemplation is just reminding ourselves, uh, reminding each other that we are flowing streams, um, that we're not separate selves. Because very often when we look at each other on a day-to-day -day basis, we're often caught in this, you are you and, and I am I, I am me. And um, in Plum Village, our daily practice is to remove these ideas of, uh, kind of, uh, our practice is to remove um, a kind of dualistic thinking that we very often engage in, in our daily lives. Mm. For instance, um, when we take a step on Mother Earth, mm. when I was walking this morning, mm. it's clear that Mother Earth is not separate from me. But very often when we're walking, we think, we may think, I'm not sure if you in here think like that, but we may think that uh, uh, we're separate from, from Mother Earth. Mm. But when I walk, uh, I take my steps in mindfulness, I can remember. Um, actually, every ounce of my energy comes from Mother Earth. And so when I recognize that, every piece of carrot, every... Uh, piece of broccoli that I've uh, eaten. Everything that I've consumed to give me energy comes from Mother Earth. So the Earth inside is not so different from the Earth outside. And when I come back um, and uh, to my steps, and just being with my steps, uh, feeling the contact with the Earth, I can get in touch with this truth. Uh, especially when my mind is not so busy, when my mind is not thinking too much or not running, not pursuing uh, things uh, that have already happened or things that will happen, etc. I can get in touch with this, uh, with this truth that I'm not separate from Mother Earth. And when I can experience the, my mindful step further, I can also see that I'm not separate from Tay. Because without Tay, I don't think for myself and maybe for most of us, we may never have had the chance to experience walking uh, in such a way. Taking a step like that, uh, taking one step and just to be able to enjoy 
that one step, that one moment, without our minds worrying too much about anything, or running after anything. And that, our capacity, our ability to take a step like that, is things to take. So in your step, as you are walking, you can see Tay is walking with you. We can see, we can feel Tay walking with us. So I hope today, for Tay's continuation day, we can, uh, as we're drinking tea, or as we're walking, or as we're eating our, our meal in mindfulness, that we can experience being with Tay in this way. Uh, Tay has shared his energy of mindfulness and his, uh, and that energy of mindfulness has shared uh, has been shared by the Buddha, and also even before the Buddha's time, they had also uh, mindfulness was also there. So we share this energy together, and when we practice it, we are a part of this stream. You can. See yourself as a part of this stream uh, of ancestors who have come before and who have practiced mindfulness. As I was coming back to my breathing, I got in touch with my fear. Uh, Fear of losing my thought. (laughs) Uh, Something like that. Um, And I think in each of us, there we have a lot of fears. Um, If you don't have a lot of fears in your daily life, that means you practice very well. but I see in, uh, for myself, there, there are a lot of fears. And when I look around, I also recognize a lot of fears uh, present in my brothers and sisters and the friends uh, uh, who are here. And um, many of these fears, they have their roots in what we call original fear, or you can say original desire. They're two sides of the same thing. And um, what they call original fear. And uh, they said, uh, the first fear we have, the original fear, is the fear of death. Because when we uh, were born, when we were first uh, brought into, uh, into life, given birth, physical birth by our mother, um, there's a moment that's very, very uh, tense. And it's a life or death moment. Um, we hadn't learned how to take our first breath yet. And uh, in order to take that first breath, there's uh, huge amounts of efforts that we have to do. And the doctor, of course, helped by kind of expelling whatever amniotic fluid we still had left so that we can take our first breath, uh, so that the baby can cry out. That first cry is uh, the first in-breath the baby is able to make.
And in that moment, mm, our fear is born. We tried our best to take that that breath. If we couldn't make it, then we die. So the very first fear we have is the fear of dying, fear of dying. And along with that fear of dying is also the desire to live, the desire to survive. So in that one moment, both the fear of death and the desire uh, to survive are born at the same time. Um, And as babies, of course, we're very vulnerable. We can't do anything on our own. We can't feed ourselves. We can't walk. We can't take care of ourselves. Unlike uh, many different uh, mammals, when they're first born, they can already walk. Uh, they can at least do a little bit to fend for themselves. There's a bit more independence. But for us, when we are first born, for human beings, when we're first born, uh, we're completely dependent on the care of another person, on our mother, on our father, on those around us. And so there's a real fear that if... um, There's a real fear that um, um, if there's no one around to take care of us, we won't survive. Um, So when you can imagine a baby, if left to its own devices, when you get hungry, you cry out. You cry out as loud as you can in order to... and. uh, the first time you discover that uh, crying out as long as you can, someone comes, and then you see, oh, I cry. If I cry as loud as I can, uh, if I make enough noise, someone will come and take care of me, offer me food, offer me a warm blanket. So anytime something unpleasant happens to me, I can cry out, and someone will come and take care of me. I have a nephew who um, I was lucky enough to be home when he was born, and so I got to take care of him for the first few months of his life. And I remember when he was four months old, he knew how to hold his milk bottle already. And... um, And so I thought, well, if he knew how to hold his milk bottle already, then I can just put him, leave him down. He can hold his own milk bottle and I can go do something else. And he picked up really quickly that, uh, anyhow, so so I put him down and I walked somewhere somewhere else and then I came back. And then he saw me and the first time he was still holding his milk bottle. So I went away again. And then I came back, and he dropped his milk bottle. So then I came up to him, and I picked up his milk bottle, and that was a mistake. (laughs) Actually, it wasn't a mistake, but it was like very, a lot of micro-calculations happening. Anyhow, I picked up his milk bottle, and I think from there he learned that if he held his own milk bottle, I would leave him. So after that, he refused to hold his milk bottle. And every time, or you know, once or twice, it happened a couple of times later that he would hold his milk bottle, I walked by, and then he would drop it. <laughs> and then he learned, I don't need to hold my milk bottle. You know, if I hold my milk bottle, she's going to leave me. <laughs> and yes, so this is... Um, and it seems... Uh, she can, she's uh, m- more uh, well equipped to take care of me than I am of myself. Hold the milk bottle. Anyhow, I'm just imagining these uh, baby conversations going on in him. But I recognize as a, ba- as a baby, babies, they have, they're very uh, intelligent and they're very smart at getting other people to take care of them. And uh, as Tay said, 
as we're a ba- when we're a baby, we learn how to strategize. This is a way that we strategize in order to survive. For instance, if I cry out as, lo- as loud as I can, someone will come and take care of me. If I drop my milk bottle, someone's going to hold it for me. <laughs> um, anyhow, I find in the Sangha we do have a few... I won't say brothers, maybe. I can identify a sister or two who likes to drop her milk bottle. <laughs> because when she does, then someone else can pick it up for her. Um, and I often drop my own milk bottle too. Uh, I also, I see I have this as well. I drop my milk bottle and I wait for someone to come and pick it up for me. and. That's when I think, oh, it's better to have that person do it for me. Something like that. I don't know if you can recognize these uh, baby habit energies in you. So as babies, we learn how to strategize. And uh, it's for uh, self-preservation. And uh, we can can recognize... uh, um, how the need to survive, how the desire to live, how the desire to survive, and the fear of uh, not being able to survive, the fear of death is still operating in our, in our daily lives. Um, I remember when I was in Deer Park, we um, learned how to play volleyball. So the brothers were always very good at it, but the sisters, we weren't so good at it yet. So uh, we formed a kind of like a, a training, a training team. So the brothers, they, uh, they, they had an opportunity to train some of the younger sisters to play volleyball. We'd get, you know, we would line up and they would pass us the ball and we would just keep trying to receive and hit the ball and try to direct it in a, a good direction, in the right direction. It was quite uh, intensive training for a monastic. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I remember at that time uh, in Deer Park, we had quite a few good volleyball players, and um, they really knew how to keep the ball from hitting the ground. Uh, it means wherever the ball, no matter how far the ball away the ball is or how fast it came, they were always able to catch it, even if at the risk of bodily harm, like they would dive after it, or, um, you know, dive sideways, dive forward, dive left, dive right, I don't know, dive backwards. <laughs> and, and I noticed something as I was playing volleyball, that I could never allow myself to dive after the ball because I was so afraid of falling. And um, every single time we played volleyball, I knew this habit was so strong in me. And so no matter how much we trained with the brothers, and at one point they did teach us to dive after the ball, I couldn't do it. And the most I could do was just bend one knee and extend my arms to get the ball. But that was my, that was the most I could do to dive after a ball. And so over time, I really noticed this was so strong that no matter how much I tried to imagine myself diving after a ball, I couldn't. And no matter how many times the brothers hit the ball a little bit further away, I couldn't dive after it. I would just bend a knee, extend my arms. If I couldn't make it, that's fine. (laughs) But I couldn't dive after it. And uh, we even went to the... uh, the beach to, sometimes we had outings to the, the beach. And uh, of course it was a very nice beach, so just very soft sand, nice sand. Anybody can dive in sand, you know, you fall and you don't get hurt. And I still couldn't do it. And I remember that one day we were at the beach and everybody was teasing me about this. And it's like, no, you can do it, it's easy, look. And they would fall. Look, 
painful. <laughs> I was like, no, it's not easy. And but somehow I couldn't do it. And then, but I kept, you know, challenging myself. I kept trying. And then finally, I was able to do it. I was able to dive, you know, for maybe the message that was sent a hundred times finally came in that I can dive after the ball without getting hurt. I actually did it one time and I was able to fall. I just fell flat. Basically it was, it was lucky we were on sand. <laughs> we, were, and we were on sand and not on, a, on asphalt. In Deer Park we played volleyball in this uh, old basketball court. So it was like asphalt, and of course I wasn't going to dive and allow myself to get hurt <laughs> on, uh, on asphalt. But I remember the first time I was able to dive in um, and uh, to catch the ball and to really fall um, and to realize that, oh, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> I, uh, I'm still alive. It wasn't too bad diving after this uh, ball. And then from then on, I could do it. But I needed that one experience to tell me that I was safe and, uh, and that this was possible. And that I, I could allow myself. What I realized was I never allowed myself to fall before. And that one time diving, I actually allowed myself to fall. Mm. So that was volleyball. But I also noticed in, uh, in my daily life too, there were many things that I didn't allow myself uh, to do. But it was also out of this sense of self-preservation. Um, for instance, making mistakes. You know, as a novice, you get reminded all the time of things. And... Uh, and I remember every time someone reminded me of something, of course I would explain myself away. No, I did that because that happened, because that, because that, because she did this or he did that, etc. And in my novice days, I remember there was a venerable nun. She, <laughs> she was visiting Plum Village and she said, Oh, the sister's here. They explain themselves away all the time, you know. Because actually one of our fine manners as monastics is when we get reminded of something uh, or um, corrected about something, then one of our fine manners is just to join our palms and to, to bow. Uh, join our palms and, and, and to bow. So this explaining happened before I learned how to fall in Deer Park, just to let you know. Uh, and so as a novice, even, even the, uh, the training that we had to join our palms and bow, sometimes I would join my palms and bow and then I explain myself away. And after that fall in Deer Park, what I realized was it was connected. It was connected. Um, that I couldn't allow uh, myself to make mistakes, just as I couldn't allow myself to fall. And that's why I couldn't even join my palms to bow when someone corrected me and to say, oh yeah, I could do better. I could, that I could, I could do better. Because if you say I could do better, it means I made a mistake. And I don't want, I didn't want to admit that I made a mistake. So it was a real training um, I found. Um, after that, I really appreciated that practice of just, mm, yeah, every time someone uh, corrected me or reminded me of something, I join my palms and bow. Now I don't really physically do it, but there's a mental bow there. I could. I should, uh, I should do this to show the, the outer form more. 
make it more obvious. Um, I wanted to say a little bit more about this self-preservation thing. Mm. the desire to protect ourselves, um, to survive, to live, you can say. And our self-preservation, it, I find it depends on our sense of, of self. What it is that we want to protect, uh, the kind of self that we want to protect, depends on the, the kind of the sense of self that we have, and um, um, this could be limited to maybe our body or um, our self can be even extended to our family. Sometimes we want to protect our family. Well, I wanted to get into this because I find um, when we learn about Buddhist psychology, especially about store consciousness, um, so one of the functions of store consciousness, it's very powerful. It has a very uh, strong, powerful ability to appropriate a sense of self and to preserve, protect the uh, this sense of self. Um, so, for instance, when we look into our maybe I draw this out. <laughs> uh, just very classic Buddhist psychology, store consciousness mind consciousness, and in store we have all kinds of seeds, right? We have all kinds of seeds. Um, We have seeds of anger, we have seeds of joy, seeds of compassion, seeds of happiness, seeds of uh, um, anger, etc. And there's this part of store, so all all of these seeds, Sometimes there's this part of store that goes, oh yes, this seed of compassion is me. Um, this seed of uh, joy is me. This seed of jealousy is not me. So, no, I'm not a jealous person. So anyhow, there's a function in store, whereas each of us, we contain all the seeds. We have every single potential in us, in each one of us, we are, we have all kinds of potentials. The potential to be this, to the potential to be that, the, to a greater or lesser extent, we have all these potentials. But sometimes we look at this storehouse and we say, yes, we just pick and we select, we filter out, rather than saying, yes, I have all of this. We say, no, no, I'm this, I'm this, I'm that. And even our image is 
also in in uh, stored consciousness, how we see ourselves, tall, short, all these seeds are also in us, uh, light, dark, or etc. Successful, fail, failure, you you name it, it's there. So there's this function in store that we call appropriate. That it it can appropriate a self. So you you select you select um, and you say ah this is me this is myself and that that uh, part that the part of stored consciousness that does it, it we call it oh, we have a name for it it's called manas. So we appropriate and we protect. We protect this self. That's why in Shining Light when someone goes, um, oh, you don't seem to be very mindful when you walk to the dining hall, for instance. Maybe there's a reaction in you. or like, I'm mindful when I walk to the dining hall. Well, that's because you don't agree with... <laughs> you, you have this sense of... Uh, yourself being mindful when you do a certain thing or you have the sense of yourself as being mindful or being whatever. Um, so we have this sense of self and it could, it's not just about the seeds in our store consciousness that we appropriate, um, but we appropriate m- many, many other things as well. Like, of course, our body, our family, could be our communities. Um, can you name anything? Can you name something that you identify with, that you think, ah, oh, this is... Friends? Okay. Gender? Did someone say gender? Yeah. Yeah, it could be even Brother Fablai, last time he mentioned about the four boxes that we put. This is also a way of appropriating the self species, human versus other species. Or we identify ourselves as humans. Um, and maybe somewhere along here you can put political affiliations. And even the earth. Culture. Volleyball team. Volleyball team. <laughs> the winning one. Surrounding. Pardon? Surrounding. Surrounding is yes, your, your environment. Your feelings, yes, we do appropriate. Anything else? Possessions. Possessions, yes. Don't touch my sweater. This is my sweater. Don't wear my shoes. These are my shoes. Does anyone suffer when someone else wears their shoes? I do. <laughs> the, the shoes have become um, an extension of myself. So, depending on your sense of self, the bigger, basically, the more possessions you seem to have, the bigger the sense of self-preservation. You don't want people to touch your family. You don't want people to touch your community. 
You don't want people to touch your friends, do harm to your friends. You don't want people to... Uh, you don't want people to slander your sense of uh, gender identity. You don't want people to... Um, you don't want to think that humans are below other species, for instance. Mm. And in one way, you can see that um, when we have this, uh, this sense of, of self, when we appropriate uh, this self, and uh, when we want to protect it, um, mm, to such an extent that um, we lose our freedom. Uh, oh, no, I shouldn't say that. When we have this sense of self, so there's fears, there's fears of losing. Once you have this, you want to protect it. Um, you think if you don't protect it, you'll lose it, it will die, it will die. Uh, and become no more, and you hang on to it. Mm. So initially, our fear of uh, birth and death, which is to ourselves as a baby, uh, surviving or not surviving in that initial moment, later on as we grow older, uh, it becomes much bigger because of our sense of self. Our, what we want to protect becomes uh, much, much bigger. Mm. <coughs> And you might ask, so what's wrong with identifying with the body, or with my family, or with communities, or gender, or species, or even the earth? Why can't I identify with the, with the earth? Um, why can't I, I, I identify with the uh, certain political party. Uh, what's wrong with that? Mm. Very often when we do so, uh, it's not with the mind of non-discrimination. It's with the mind of discrimination that we do so. Um, but when we do so with the mind of non-discrimination, it, it's different. Mm. There's an image that um, I really like uh, that Tay used in his uh, summer dharm dharma talks to the children. It's um, uh, the image of the umbilical cord. And uh, so when we are first going back to this child, this baby, when we are first born, our umbilical cord is cut. And we have a uh, uh, the feeling that we are uh, no longer connected uh, with our mother. Um, we're no longer connected with our mother. We have this uh, we have this beginning of this separation. Mm. And Tay said, in one of his meditations, one day, um, he was able to see that he had an umbilical cord. There was an umbilical cord that connected Tay to the sun. Because without the sun, of course, there would be no life, <laughs> as we know it, on, uh, on, on Earth. Uh, no humans as we know it on earth. So it's very clear that 
there was an umbilical cord to Tay and the son. And looking uh, further, looking deep, deeper, he saw that there was an umbilical cord to him and so many other things, uh, trees, um, animals, minerals, etc. Mm. So each day, we, uh, when we practice to recognize how we are connected to everything, uh, recognize that we do still have this umbilical cord to our mother, even our father, our ancestors. Uh, recognizing how we are still connected um, to all, all things. And uh, recognizing uh, our roots. That's our daily practice of trying to remove the dualistic thinking that we often engage in. Mm. And when we can recognize all of these roots, these uh, uh, umbilical cords that we have, we can see that uh, our body is not outside of our family, our family is not outside of our comili- communities. All of these things have an umbilical cord to each other. And when we want to protect uh, the one, we are also protecting the, the all. When I first came to Plum Village, I was very moved um, when Tay shared about uh, creating an altar in your home. Of course, of course, growing up Vietnamese, I, we had altar, an altar in our home. Um, but somehow I had lost touch with this, uh, this altar. It was just kind of like a... Um, a table in our house. Uh, But I didn't really feel like I had connection to it. And then when I came to Plum Village and Tay encouraged everyone to uh, set up an ancestral altar at home, I was was very moved by it. Because he said, um, "Mm, when we are able to connect with our ancestors, with our roots, then we stop feeling so alienated. And at the time, I was feeling alienated, but I couldn't identify. I, I didn't know that I was feeling alienated. Just like sometimes when you're feeling lonely, you don't know that you're feeling lonely until someone comes and hangs out with you. And you're like, oh, you know, the day before I was feeling lonely, or the moment before I was feeling lonely, something like that. Um, but when Tay shared that, I didn't realize that that was what I was suffering from, a, a sense of a bit of an uh, alienation. I had uh, somehow lost touch with my roots, uh, with my ancestors, with my blood ancestors, as well as my spiritual ancestors. And there was a little bit of suffering that came up in that. And later when I found out um, uh, a little bit of the origins to this, why Tay started sharing about uh, establishing an altar in, uh, in, in the home. It was because he, he observed uh, in the West that there was this terrible sense of alienation. Everyone was so independent and uh, our individualism 
the, our sense of individuality was so strong that we'd forgotten that this is connected to this. We have our roots. We have our roots not just in our blood and spiritual ancestors, but also in the land ancestors. Mm. And one story that really moved me was um, during the war in Vietnam, uh, when the troops were going through Hue, um, and Thea told this uh, one time, when the troops were going through Hue, the families uh, in Hue, what they did was, and they thought that it would stop the tanks from going through the city, what they did was they took the altars uh, from their homes. And the altar in a Vietnamese home is kind of like the most, one of the most sacred places because that's where you go to, you know, when you are uh, getting married or uh, entering school or getting a diploma or your business is successful or your business failed or whatever it was. It was kind of like... Um, it was kind of like a news reporting, CNN, <laughs> you know. You would go to this altar, actually, not CNN. It's kind of like your, your psychotherapist. You, say, you, you go to this altar and you just present everything that was happening in your daily life. And you have this conversation with your ancestors and, uh, and you ask for their support. So the altar in these Vietnamese homes were something very sacred, and they always keep it clean, you know, proper incense, flowers, and, you know, there's this ritual of keeping the altars clean. But uh, during the Vietnam War, when uh, the troops were coming in, so they, these families, uh, some of them, they brought these altars. Something, a place that's very sacred and you never really touch, they moved these altars out to the, the front gate of their home, thinking that these altars would prevent, and would be able to protect them and prevent the troops and the soldiers from, from coming in and destroying the city. Because that act was taking something that you valued the most, that was most sacred to you, and you felt that had the most spiritual authority, you brought it out and you placed it in front of your home as a form of protection. And um, of course it didn't stop. Mm -hmm. The altars, uh, you know, soldiers passed by, troops passed by, uh, some of them even trampling on some of these altars. Uh, the tanks went through. And uh, Tay realized that uh, when, he, uh, when he heard that, when he saw that, he realized that um, you could only do something like that when you don't see the value of these ancestors. You could only do something like that when you yourself don't have a connection to your own ancestors, when you yourself feel alienated. Um, And uh, he saw that uh, the troops, they were able to trample on this ancestor because they themselves had no, these ancestral altars, because they themselves weren't able to connect to the significance of that because they didn't have that, uh, that practice in their daily life. They didn't have that, uh, uh, that value. Um, that connection to... Uh, to the blood and spiritual ancestors. So it was very important. Um, so hearing that, I, I, I saw the sense of introducing. After that, Tay wanted to, uh, Tay shared about uh, the practice of setting up an altar in, uh, in your home, in every home. And um, even though I grew up with the altar in my home, when I came to Plum Village, I reconnected with that uh, altar. And um, when I go home on home visit now, I, I do have 
conversations with my ancestors. I light up the incense. I, you know, I talk to my father as if he's there. I talk to my grandparents. I talk to my um, my ancestors, even the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, because you can have a conversation. They're wonderful therapists, you know. <laughs> they really know how to listen to everything that uh, you have to share without judging, reacting, giving too much advice, <laughs> uh, etc. Um, so it's a good, sometimes it's a good kind of circulation to have these conversations um, with, uh, uh, with them. So recognizing our roots, um, getting in touch with our spiritual and ancestral roots, uh, to take care of our alienation, to take care of our uh, kind of like false sense of self, because we're not separate. We are a stream. We are a flowing stream. Um, So today's topic was actually about moral courage. (laughs) And I have 15 minutes left to get to moral courage. (laughs) Uh, And I want to say, so in Buddhism, um, when we think about, uh, when we speak about courage, it, uh, and I remember this in my Buddhist youth, going to the temples, they would speak about uh, compassion, uh, wisdom, or insight. and courage. And these three things always, uh, always go together. So it's, you know. These, um, we cannot really have courage without compassion or wisdom and vice versa. Once you have compassion, there's wisdom there, and courage is also there. Um, So, Te often speaks about uh, the three powers, or the three kinds of courage that we can have. Um, I'll switch over to the word power. So, he speaks about the power to understand. Uh, the power to love and the power to let go. So when we speak about understanding, um, we're speaking about understanding suffering. Because um, when we practice mindfulness, we know that uh, it always a mental formation always has an object. <laughs> mindfulness is always mindfulness of something, and anger is always anger of something. So understanding is also always understanding of something. You cannot just have understanding alone. So understanding here is uh, understanding suffering. Um, Especially when we can understand our own suffering or the suffering of uh, others, we can give rise to compassion. when we look at someone uh, who's suffering, who's in a lot of suffering, or who's experiencing a lot of suffering, um, in our family or in our community, 
Sometimes this suffering spills over to the other members of the family or other members of the community. And when you look at that brother or sister or when you look at your loved one, your family member, you can see that um, at the time that they're suffering, they don't know how to handle their suffering. Like it could be a lot of anger or irritation, and we don't know how to handle it. Mm. And then the suffering spills over. Uh, so when you see, we see that uh, our loved one, this uh, brother or sister, um, at the moment that they're suffering, they're, they're not able to handle their suffering. So you see that they're, you can easily recognize that uh, they're a victim. They're, at the moment, they are a victim of their suffering. And when we see this, we can give rise to compassion. We don't want to do anything that would make that person to suffer more. Mm. Um, so in our um, in our daily lives, in our daily meditations, in our daily contemplations, uh, we have to really uh, train ourselves to come back and to recognize uh, the kind of suffering that's present in us, whether that is um, in the form of tension in your body. Your body could have a lot of tension right now. And why is that? Maybe we haven't uh, taken good care of our body lately. Maybe we've overworked our body. Um, We haven't nourished our body enough. Maybe we have too much judgment of our body and this really prevents us from taking care of our body, from really uh, um, expressing the care and love that our body needs. So being mindful of our body, the, the state of our body, the health of our body, uh, and taking care, uh, that's the kind of suffering we have to address. Um, especially nowadays in our world, when everywhere there's a lot of busyness, Everyone is overscheduled, over uh, kind of overworked. Um, we're chasing many things, too many things, so we tend to get overscheduled, overworked. We forget to take care of our bodies, and a lot of tension builds up. So that's one suffering that we have to learn how to take care of. And. Um, Looking into our feelings, we can recognize uh, there's some suffering there too, maybe. (laughs) Uh, So our daily mindfulness, our daily practice is to be able to come home to ourselves, to recognize what's going on in our body, in our feelings, uh, in our perceptions. the kinds of feelings that are causing us suffering, the kinds of perceptions that are causing us some suffering. And uh, we learn how to take care of them. We learn how to look deeply into them.
I remember um, when I heard the, fir- the five mindfulness trainings for the first time. It was in uh, a uh, transmission ceremony, and I wasn't a part of it, but just li- uh, sitting in the audience and hearing uh, the reading of the five mindfulness trainings. I was, I was so moved, I just started to cry. Um, because before that, I thought I knew, uh, I thought I knew myself, I thought I knew, you know, uh, sometimes in our naivety we have this sense that, oh, I'm a good person. And when I go home, I recognize this in my mother too. Uh, she goes, oh, I'm a good person. What do you mean? I don't make anyone suffer. Anyhow, the first time I heard the five mindfulness trainings, and the reason why I cried so much was because I realized I had done so many things that made so many people suffer. <laughs> uh, the five mindfulness trainings, um, they start with aware of the suffering caused by, and then list a number of actions. Uh, I am determined not to, a number of actions, and I'm determined to cultivate a number of actions. Um, But they really help us to look deeply into suffering. So suffering is not just an abstract uh, thing, but it applies to so many different areas of our our life. Uh, In uh, in how we think, we, we also can contribute to suffering, uh, to harm. In how we speak, we do a lot of uh, damage, a lot of harm. In how we consume, we also do damage, we do harm. Um, And when I heard the five mindfulness trainings for the first time, I realized, spelled out so clearly, so many areas that I had contributed to suffering for myself, my family, and also for, uh, for the world uh, in general. So I just sat there and I, I just, I cried. Later on when I read the 14 mindfulness trainings, I cried even more because it was spelled out even more. Uh, the many different ways um, that, uh, still even more ways, more ways that we can uh, cause suffering to ourselves and and to others. And I find um, uh, when we speak about moral courage, this is a term that I I keep coming across in in kind of the collective consciousness now, in the media or in the the voice of the young people. Very often I'm picking up this term, moral courage. And uh, it kind of brings me back to that time when when morality or things has to do with being a good person or not a good person, or uh, choosing the right thing to do or not the right thing to do. But it wasn't so much about the awareness of suffering, the different kinds of suffering that are going on in the world, in ourselves and in the world, and how we're contributing to it. Mm. So sometimes I hear the young people say moral courage, but there's that question, you know, is it just about being good or not being good for them? Can they see clearly? Can we see clearly? Uh, uh, what this moral courage, uh, what it takes to have this moral courage and uh, to look into our ethics and our values. So the five mindfulness trainings are, and the 14 are an expression of uh, concrete expression of uh, global ethics. And uh, I do hope that um, they can be shared more widely in our uh, our society, um, so that those uh, naive young people like me back then could see more clearly and uh, mm, have a chance to learn a little bit more about the different things that we do that contribute to to harm, to suffering, or actually some of the things that we do that are, are, are uh, 
contributing to happiness. Um, I have three of the trainings kind of here. And when I said uh, the 14 mindfulness trainings, when we read them, it, um, I cried even more because I realized um, even more ways that I was <laughs> causing harm. Um, the third mindfulness training is um, aware of the suffering brought about when we impose our views on others. Uh, we are determined not to force others, even our children, by any means whatsoever, such as authority, threat, money, propaganda, or indoctrination, to adopt our views. I used to bribe my younger brothers uh, with money so they can <laughs> agree with me. <laughs> so I was quite guilty of that, yeah. I also threatened them um, by withholding, you know, time, energy, money, or material resources when they didn't agree with me. So that was, I was really guilty of this. Um, and we will, however, learn to help others let go of and transform fanaticism and narrowness through loving speech and compassionate dialogue. This training really opened up uh, new doors for me when I first read it. Because before I thought, well, very naive idea. Everybody has a right to believe in what they want to believe in. And I have a right to believe in what I want to believe in. And somehow in my mind, dialogue wasn't so possible. It's just, you believe in what you want to believe, and I'll believe in what I want to believe, you know? I don't need to listen to you, because it's fine what you believe. <laughs> and uh, I'll believe what I want to believe. Um, and in that kind of thinking, there wasn't so much uh, dialogue. It was kind of like a passive kind of agreement, passive kind of uh, uh, peace. Mm -mm. Um, yeah, there wasn't much dialogue, there wasn't much understanding. Um, so these trainings um, really were doors for me to, to look at suffering much more deeply, uh, at the ways I thought or at the ways I was uh, behaving that had contributed to, to suffering. Um, so understanding, understanding is um, one of the powers that uh, we can have, and understanding suffering, especially. Um, they said that uh, we can be victim of fame, of success, or wealth, but we can never be victim of our understanding. So we can. Um, the more we understand, especially the more we understand about the suffering that's going on in ourselves and uh, in the world, um, the more courage we have. Um, it's a kind of spiritual, it's a kind of uh, spiritual power. Mm, the second kind of power is uh, the power to love. And, um, or the courage, courage to love. And we can see that uh, oftentimes it's, it's easy to love things that are pleasant. Or when we look at people around us and we think, oh, I really love this brother, I really love that sister, she's so joyful and kind. and you know, very helpful all the time. Uh, those brothers and sisters are easy to love. So we think, oh, they're lovable. But Tay says that may not be uh, true love. It's kind of like just an enjoyment. You just enjoy their presence. But in terms of loving, um, 
that may not be the case. So sometimes we have to um, kind of challenge ourselves a bit to uh, love those who are difficult to love, uh, because then we can see the limits of our own own love. We see the limits. Mm. For instance, in America right now, there are uh, a lot of protesters. You may or may not agree with their view. And um, the protesters, uh, they may trigger feelings of discomfort, uh, feelings of discomfort in us. Mm. But are we, mm, rather than writing someone off, rather than uh, saying, oh, these people, um, they're causing suffering. Mm. Why are they causing suffering? Can we see them as a flowing stream? Can we hear their suffering? Can we take care of the suffering that's being triggered in us mm, in order to hear the suffering that is being uh, said, being voiced? Because sometimes when we hear, um, like, I'm one of the sisters in the hamlet who likes to problem solve, uh, uh, solve problems. I'm, somehow, I, I, I don't know, something in my character that uh, likes to solve problems. So I end up having a lot of sisters come to me with, uh, with problems. It's kind of like a mini protest. <laughs> You can, you can say, uh, and, uh, and sometimes when the sisters come to me with a problem, oftentimes the way they are sharing it with me, um, it sounds like I'm being held accountable for this suffering, <laughs> for this problem that's going on in the hamlet. Like, um, and, uh, and when it's being shared like that, oh, you have to do something about this because you are one of the sisters who are in the front row or something like that. And then I get, you know, I get triggered. I get triggered. So at this moment, I have to breathe. I have to come back to my breathing. And I have to stay with my breathing. I have to embrace the feeling of uh, discomfort that has just come up. And if I don't do this, I won't be able to recognize what the real problem is, what the suffering is. Because all I'm hearing is, why is this person holding me accountable for this? You know, what do I have to do with it? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't cause that problem, for instance. Uh, or even if uh, that problem was there my, and my ancestors had caused it, it's all over. Why are you holding me accountable? So all of these things we have to, to recognize in ourselves uh, when we get triggered, when feelings of discomfort come up, especially when someone is expressing a, a kind of suffering. We have to be able to come back to our breathing and really anchor ourselves uh, in, our, in our breathing and allow... Um, so that we can have enough strength to listen to what suffering is there, what suffering is trying to be expressed. Um, otherwise we can easily um, dismiss it. Mm. So it's not, not easy to express your love to someone who is 
saying things that are unpleasant or to you that are unpleasant or doing things to you that are unpleasant. Uh, but that's our chance to come back. Uh, come back to our breathing. Um, come back um, to our awareness that uh, this suffering is there because um, because there's no solution to it yet. The suffering is there because um, we don't have an answer to it yet. So if we say that, uh, I don't want to hear about it, or it's your fault, or something like that, then we never figure out a solution to it. And we come back to our breathing to see that, again, we are a stream, and the other person is a stream. Um, Especially with the the protests that are happening in uh, in America over uh, injustice, I remember when I was uh, young too. It it was about. Um, mm, I thought, well, if if you knew how to handle the um, kind of. Uh, discrimination in, in, in the mind, if you knew how to kind of change your mind, if you know how to change your attitude, if you knew how to, um, you know, work harder, etc., then you'd be able to address the, uh, you'd be able to solve your own problems. You'd be able to, um, to address the suffering. But it's not that simple. It's not that simple. Because there's a there's a systemic aspect. Mm. So when we say, "Oh, this suffering comes from this uh, stream of ancestors, this this hundred years of uh, oppression, or hundred years of a uh, few hundred years of uh, say slavery, for instance." We cannot just say, that's over. Now you can work harder. Now you can, you can uh, do things to change your, uh, your, your life. Uh, it's not that simple. Because actually we are a part of it. We are a part of it. Everyone, every one of us is a part of it still. Mm. So to say that, uh, that person or that group of people just needs to work harder or change their behavior. It's not enough. We also have to change our behavior. And also the systems. Um, So the last power is the power to let go, the power to cut off. When we, um, let's say, when we have anger in our heart for a long time, or resentment towards someone, and uh, finally we're able to let it go, or begin anew and to let, let it go, we feel really light. We feel, uh, we feel at peace again. Mm. There's a story that the Buddha told about the cows. I think you've all heard this one already. Um, so there's this farmer who, was, um, who had lost his cows. The Buddha was somewhere. And there's this farmer who had lost his cows. And um, they, um, 
he went uh, past the Buddha and the, the monks and nuns, the monks, <laughs> the bhikkhus, and he asked, oh, have you seen my cows? Um, I've lost them somewhere. Without my cows, I won't be able to uh, do the harvest. I'll lose, I'll lose everything. And he was really suffering over this. And the Buddha said, um, no, I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't seen your cows. But maybe they've gone in that direction. So he went to, uh, to look for the cows, the farmer. And when the farmer left, then the Buddha said, uh, looked at the big shoes and he said, uh, aren't, you, aren't you glad? You, um, aren't you happy that you don't have any cows to lose? Um, we're much more luckier than the farmer. Um, we don't have cows to lose. And um, so in our, in, our, uh, in our life, we can reflect a little bit to see what kind of cows do we have that are causing us, that are a bit heavy to hold on to, whether it could be a responsibility, a home, a mortgage, a bank account, <laughs> I don't know. What are some, a relationship? a difficulty, what are some of the things that we can release and let go of? Uh, and when Tay told this story, he asked us to write a, on a sheet of paper all of, the, all of the cows that we have right now and uh, whether or not we can let go of them. And our cows could be views. It could be a view about ourself that we need to let go of. Sometimes that's a cow too. Oh, my body is not beautiful enough. Or my body is not healthy enough. That's also a kind of cow. It prevents us from really uh, getting in touch with ourselves, uh, with our body, and, to, and taking care of it. It may be a view about our family, our communities, our political party, for instance. Um, our cows may also be our ideas about happiness or, or success. Mm. Only when this person wins the presidency will, I, will my country be happy. For instance, that could be an idea that prevents us from being happy although it's a very strong one and difficult to let go. <laughs> uh, so ideas about happiness or success or views are sometimes more difficult to let go of than even possessions. Uh, many of us were here in Plum Village. We've chosen to leave our home behind, our cars behind. We come here and we live in community, one bed box. Or if you're a lay friend, one box, one bed. <laughs> Sometimes you don't even have a cabinet to put your things in. Uh, but we've chosen to come here and let go of our possessions. And those are the easy things to let go of, our worldly possessions. Mm. But maybe our ideas are much more difficult to let go of. Ideas even when we're here. How Plum Village should be. Um, Ideas about how I should practice. Ideas about the, mm, yeah, what happiness is. Mm -hmm. So letting go, learning out how to uh, cut off, letting go of our ideas. Uh, and the more we let go, the lighter we feel, the happier we feel, especially ideas. Mm or views. So to sum it up, <laughs> um, when we look into moral courage, when we look into uh, how to have moral courage, um, I think, first of all, we have to look into our fears. 
what are the kinds of fears that are operating in, in, our, in our lives right now, in our daily life. Um, especially fears that center around self-preservation. Because when we, uh, if we can't recognize these fears and, and how they are operating, um, when it comes down for us to make a decision, our decision will be based on fear. Mm. So in our daily lives, we want to look deeply into our fear and to kind of uh, help to remove some of the fears that we have. Um, looking deeply into our fears, and then looking deeply into our sense of self, how we appropriate a sense of self. Uh, Can we let go of our sense of self to touch uh, kind of a higher higher truth? Um, And um, we have to also cultivate our understanding of suffering. Um, When we want to have, be able to uh, to make better choices, better decisions, have the courage to stand up for something, or to speak out against something, we have to be able to understand the suffering that is there. And the more we understand about the suffering that is there, our compassion, our courage, uh, our insight is much bigger. So it's much easier to act. I remember in Plum Village, when we first... um, So our community was not vegan for many, many years. And uh, one year they decided, okay, Plum Village is vegan. Plum Village is vegan. So many of our brothers and sisters who had grown up in the West and used to cheese and eggs suffered so much (laughs) because suddenly we were vegan. Um, But they had heard the dialogue and they had heard the the sharings, all the sharings about the different kinds of suffering that, uh, um, you know, is inflicted on the animals, on on, on, on the planet Earth. Uh, when we consume uh, eggs and, and uh, dairy products and meat products, etc. So he had heard the suffering, so he made the decision. Uh, the decision was made out of an understanding, a very deep understanding of the suffering that was there uh, right now. And, um, and then, even while that decision was made, there was a bit of suffering in the community. <laughs> there was a lot of resistance. But again, it took some dialogue. So again, we heard more about the suffering that was happening to the planet, to the animals, to the minerals, to the earth. And then it became easier to... It became uh, quite easy for us to stick to the vegan, uh, vegan diet. Or for the community to agree to this. Uh, we're not perfectly, perfectly vegan yet, but at least on our serving tables now, there are no dairy products, no egg products, etc. Mm. So learning how to recognize the suffering so we can uh, give voice to it, so we can speak out about it. Um, Okay. Thank you so much for listening to the talk today. Um, and again, happy 94th Continuation Day to, to Tay. It is um, thanks to Tay's wisdom, courage, compassion that um, I think we are here today. And uh, today we can celebrate Tay's wisdom, courage, and compassion. We can celebrate uh, Tay in every breath that we take, we can celebrate Tay in every step that we take as well.